G'day everyone, thank you for joining us as we continue our series through the book of James and what it teaches us about how to live as disciples of Jesus. Today's topic is, does God tempt us? I mean, we all face various types of temptations, temptations in our thoughts, in our words and in our actions. And if we believe that God rules over everything, what does that mean about whether God tempts us or not? I wonder how would you how would you answer that question? How would you explain your answer to someone who might be struggling with uh, the goodness of God? Well, we're going to be looking at that very shortly. But first, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. So please pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are our God, that you are living and active. We thank you that you care about us. We thank you that you've made us in your image, that you love us and you know what's best for us. And Father, too often we can get wrapped up in our own small worlds and we confess again that we don't live up to your standard and we don't follow your will all the time. And Father, we come before you and ask for your forgiveness. Please forgive us and please, by your spirit, show us how to grow in holiness to grow in joy and in patience. Father, help us to grow in Christ-likeness. Father, we we thank you that, that we're adopted into your family as your children, not through our own works, but through what you have done and, and finished and, and worked for us. And Father, we praise you and thank you that salvation is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. We thank you for your mercy and your love. And Father, we pray for the current COVID situation that we're facing in our country, in this state and in our city. Father, we pray that you'd give the government's wisdom to know how to best care for everyone in our community. We pray for those who are unwell in hospital. And we pray for those many in our community suffering from isolation and loneliness as many good things of life have have been taken away. Father, we pray that you would comfort us, comfort all those that are suffering. Father, may you draw near to them in love and in care. Please surround them with people to support them and care for them. And Father, may we be people who care, who support, who love, who uphold those around us at this time. Father, we pray that you'd help us to point people to you, that you are the God of all comfort and peace, in whom we have our treasure, our treasure that's secure, that no moth or rust can destroy, no thief can break in and steal, not even death can separate us from your love for us. And Father, we pray for our church, that we will be a people who continue to be on mission for you, that you would give us opportunities to share our faith, to share our trust in you with others. Father, please give us courage to take those opportunities and to use them to serve others and to love our neighbour and to love our enemies. And Father, we pray that we would be a people and a church that know that you are a big God, that you're a good God, that you bring and give us many good things, Father, you're a faithful God, and we pray that we would be willing and eager to share that with others. Father, you long for more people to turn toward you, and we pray uh, that you would use us to bring that about for your glory. And Father, we bring these things before you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to now uh, read our passage today uh, from James chapter 1. So please open up your Bibles if you have them to James 1 beginning at verse 13. James 1 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, 
after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Does God ever tempt us to sin? Can we blame God for decisions we make and for desires we have? I mean, isn't God all-powerful and all-knowing? This is a huge subject, isn't it? And the Bible has a lot to say, and God gives us many helps. Now, the aim today, though, it isn't to cover all of the surrounding topics that relate to good and evil, that the question we're addressing today is this. Does God tempt us to sin? And when you think about it, the question isn't an artificial one. People do accuse God of wrongdoing. I'm sure even we Christians sometimes suggest, at least in our minds, that God has led me into temptation. We've thought it, if not said it. And the question isn't a theoretical one either. That is, we do live in a world where evil can be seen and felt. Now, James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18, is one of the key Bible passages that wrestles with this subject. But as we begin, I need to explain the word James uses, the meaning of the word temptation. And there's a question, you see, is it temptation or is it test? Now, the word James uses here has two different meanings. It can mean temptation, and the word can also mean testing or trial. Now, that's not so unusual when you think about it. In English, there are quite a number of words that have more than one meaning. Is it sower or is it sewer? You see, it's spelt the same way, but has quite a different meaning, yeah? Or is it wound or wound? I wound the bandage around the wound. You see, now the word that James is using uh, can mean testing and it can mean temptation. So testing, of course, has a positive meaning. The goal is to pass the test. When temptation, on the other hand, has a negative aim, and the aim is for you to fail. Now, the word in verse 13 is the very same word that James uses back in verse 12 and back in verse 2. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, trial and test, the same word, the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whatever, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, so is James talking about temptation or testing? Well, in short, uh, the word means test in verse 12 and in verse 2. But in verse 13, the word means temptation. And we can tell by the context that that's the meaning that ha- uh, is, is here. Now, of course, God does test us. That is true and that is biblical. But he doesn't tempt us. He doesn't tempt us. Uh, We see an emphatic answer, don't we, in this passage, and we're going to explore it together. The answer is an emphatic no. There are three parts, though, to James's argument here. We're going to spend most of our time on the first part, but we will also look at the second and third. But he begins the argument here in verse 13. Evil doesn't originate with God and is not desired by God. Evil does not originate with God and is not desired by God. Look at verse 13. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God cannot be tempted by evil, and nor does he tempt anyone. Let's look at the first phrase and then the second one. God can't be tempted by evil. The Bible shows us that God is holy. He is without a single particle of sin. God never considers sin. He not only refraining from doing evil, but ever thinking evil. And if one could look into the very depths of God's heart, it is always and only pure and perfect. The French theologian Henri Blocher explains it this way. He says, There is not the slightest hint 
of some descent into the depths to the point where the opposite meets good and evil, a dream that haunts nearly all pagan religion. God cannot be tempted by evil. There is no evil in God, no desire for evil in God. But you may think, well, hang on, wasn't Jesus tempted? I mean, how do we square James chapter 1 verse 13 with Matthew chapter 4 and with the book of Hebrews? So Matthew chapter 4 says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Hebrews 2 verse 18 says, Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You're probably familiar with those conversations between nature and nurture. Which is it? Is it nature or is it nurture? Am I born this way or have I become this way because of outside influences? Is it, am I the result of my DNA, what, what's inside me, or am I being influenced by people and circumstances around me? Now, the off- answer is often both, isn't it? We can be tempted externally, so from ideas and people around us, and we can be tempted from within, so internally. Now, Jesus was tempted, but unlike us, Jesus never sinned. He always obeyed his Father fully. And in, God, and in Jesus' heart, uh, there was no inclination for evil, no desire to entertain sin. So Jesus was subjected to real temptations by the devil. But he wasn't tempted in the sense that is from inside he had evil inclinations or desires. In fact, Jesus' experience of temptation is far more acute than ours. Uh, Leon Morris, who is perhaps Melbourne's most famous theologian. Uh, He explains it this way. The man who yields to a particular temptation has not felt its full power. He has given in while the temptation has yet something in reserve. Only the man who does not yield to temptation, who, as regards that particular temptation, is sinless, knows the full extent of that temptation. Jesus was tempted for us in the sense of he is our representative. And so to prove his his character, and therefore that he was qualified to stand in our place on the cross, he was tempted. And he was tempted, which also means, as Hebrews explains, that he understands and he can empathize with us. That's a wonderful reminder, isn't it? God isn't without understanding and empathy. But when James says God cannot be tempted, that is, there is no inclination in God for sin to sin. And nor does God tempt anyone. He doesn't want us to fall into sin. God tests us. We know that because earlier in James chapter 1, as we've already read, it talks about God giving us trials and he's testing us. He's teaching us. He's wanting us to learn to trust him. He's wanting us to learn that contentment is truly found in him and not in other things. But you see, what often happens in life is that there is one event but two very separate uh, sets of motivations or purposes. You know, two sides of one coin. When I check my social media, I often find, especially on Twitter, there are these random short videos that people ha- have shared and so it sort of comes up on, on your screen and, uh, and sometimes I show Susan and, and Imogen, you know, the cute ones about a dog doing something silly or, or a rabbit doing something rather funny. Anyway, this short video was picturing a monkey. It was about a monkey. And the monkey was trying to grab hold of a banana. But what made this, in, this video interesting is not just that there was a monkey and a banana, but you see, the monkey was in a tree and the banana was floating in a river below. And on top of that, there were four hungry tigers looking up at the monkey in a tree and they were jumping up out of the water trying to grab hold of this monkey. And so the, the video is all about, you know, it only goes for like 15 seconds, the monkey plotting and scheming, how can I get down into the river and grab this banana without the tigers grabbing me? But you see, one event, two very different purposes. 
One is to retrieve the, the, the banana. The other is to eat the monkey, you see. God does test us. And he tests us because he loves us. He teaches us and wants to grow us. But he never wants us to sin. So where does our temptation to sin come from? I mean, yes, there is the devil. Uh, we do believe in a real devil. But he is also a defeated foe. He was defeated by Christ on the cross. The devil today is wounded and he is dying. He is defeated. He has influence still in the world around us. But notice, but he is defeated. And that's important to realize that. And James doesn't say, oh, blame the devil. As though, oh, the devil made me do it. Notice where James directs our attention in verses 14 and 15. He says, and this is our next point, evil comes from our own desires. Evil comes from our own evil desires. Let me read verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. He says, each person, that is, we are responsible for our own sin. Now, other people are responsible for their sin, and they are also accountable for how and when they sin against us, and if they're pressuring us or trying to manipulate us into the sin. So they are accountable for that, and we are accountable for our own sin. So, and what James is doing here is, is explaining to us, you can't shift blame onto God. God doesn't get tempted. He doesn't, he's not tempting us to, to sin either. We are accountable. He says, when you're sinning, look to yourself. And he explains, each person is tempted when they are dragged away. Uh, the word dragged there is, uh, comes from fishing. It's a fishing analogy. Now, I'm the world's fourth worst fisherman don't know who the three worst fishermen are. I'm probably about the fourth, maybe fifth worst fisherman in the world. But even I understand the image here. James is talking about a fisherman who's thrown the line out into the water, which is very different to what I did once when we were fishing um, at the bay and I threw the whole fishing rod into the water. All right, no, not you keep, hold on to the rod. You throw the line out. And then so the line is cast. And on the end of the line, there is a hook. And on the hook, there is bait. And so once the fish is enticed, you know, he's swimming around, enjoying life, and, uh, and says, oh, there's a worm. And he sinks his teeth into this delicious-looking worm, and he's hooked. And then the fisherman then feels that, that tug on the line, and he drags the line and the fish to shore. And so James is using that idea, that image, and he's saying, that's what it's like with us. When we are tempted to sin, it's because we've been dragged along by our own evil desire and enticed. It grabs our attention. It employs our imagination. It lures our feelings with perhaps false promises. You know, I, I'll feel better if I do this. And so you do it. Well, I'll be more successful if I follow along. And so you do it. Jean-Jacques Rousseau is an influential French thinker from the 18th century. He may have lived 250 years ago, but he's left a dent on the world that we're still riding through today in our own society. Now, Rousseau believed that it's society which messes you up. It's society that messes us up. If we were all left alone, we, we would just turn out fine. That's what he thought. One of, his, uh, one of his famous sayings is this, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Now, we, we agree with that to a certain extent. Yes, you know, our social environment does play a role in influencing what we believe and how we live. So our circle of friends, um, the television programs we watch, the books we read, our education, all these things combined influence us for sure, our values and what we think is right and good. But James chapter 1 doesn't say that if 
everyone and everything else just left me alone, I would be fine and free and totally pure inside. He doesn't say that. In fact, James is saying, when you're tempted to sin, take responsibility. Look inside your own heart. That's what he's saying. Not everything I think is good and right. Not everything I desire is healthy or noble. Sin comes from within. So James talks about these desires that give birth to sin. Now, even as I explain that, I'm sure some of us realize how different that is to the way our society thinks today. It's almost anathema to say that, isn't it, in public? But what we're taught today in our universities and, and schools, our culture is telling us all the time that inside, that's who you truly are. And you are, ought to be free and you have the right to live that way. Your true self is who you think you are inside and that's good. That's what we're told all the time. But the Bible is far more nuanced, isn't it? James is pointing out that the inside is also corrupt. Death comes through sin. And sin comes through desires that are at work in us. So the sin is not just the action, but it's also the desires that we have that take something that may be good, but then we distort it or we misuse it. And, and then James says, once those desires are taking hold, they drag us and they produce the sin and eventually they produce death. Let's take a couple of examples. Uh, the thing might be sex. Uh, sex is a gift from God. It is a good gift from God that can be enjoyed within the, the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Inside that covenant relationship between a man and a woman, sex is meant to be a wonderful thing, a beautiful thing to enjoy, a gift. But outside that protective frame, it leads to all kinds of trouble and pain. Now, but you see, the problem with sex, it doesn't begin when you engage in that sexual activity. It begins when in our hearts we take what is good and then we break it apart or we misshape it. And or we have emotions that we that we bolster and use like like lust. And it's because you see, of those sinful desires that people decide I no longer trust what God says about sexuality anymore. In my heart, I've decided I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm gonna follow my heart instead of listening to what God says because my desires can't uh, be, be wrong. They can't be untrue to myself. You know, friends, one of the worst pieces of advice we can ever give to someone is follow your own heart. Or take the Aussie dream. The Australian dream is to have a home of your own, to own your own home. Now, that's not a bad thing. Owning your own home can be a good thing. But you see, the problem with having a modest lifestyle, it's not that you own a nice house with nice furniture and that you eat well and that you have some spare change to, to go to concerts or to watch movies from time to time. But what we often do, though, is attach sinful desires to those good things. So, for example, when it comes to a house, you might believe, I deserve to have a house of my own. I deserve to have a, a six-bedroom house with 15 toilets and whatever it is, you know? You know or, or you might believe you have that desire, I can't be truly content in life unless I have a house of my own. That's not true. And so because of these desires, you make decisions in life. I'm willing to work even harder to earn more money so I can keep up with this lifestyle. And it may mean that I have to sacrifice friends along the way. It may mean I have to sacrifice even time with my children. I may have to sacrifice my church life. I may have to stop giving money to gospel work so I, I can achieve this goal in my mind. You see, the sin's not the good thing, owning your own home. The sin is the wrong value that we attach to the good thing. And the sin can be the desires that we give to these things. James is saying, don't blame God when you're tempted to sin. 
Look inside your own heart. And friends, until we appreciate that the problem of sin is lying inside us, we are never going to make progress. But James doesn't leave us there in some kind of pit of despair because we keep falling into temptation. But what we find next is that he gives us helps. In fact, we find God is our helper. God gives helps to help us resist temptation. In fact, the Bible talks about many different helps that God will give us, many uh, encouragements to combat temptation. But James, he reminds us of two. God's good gifts and our God-given new life. God's good gifts and our God-given new life. Let me read verses 16 and 17. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. God doesn't tempt us to sin. James says, no, no. God gives us good gifts, perfect gifts. He is our Father. One of our children had a birthday a few weeks ago. Uh, We celebrated with a birthday cake um, and with a special dinner, and we gave gifts. Uh, None of the presents that we gave were dangerous or toxic or likely to end in death or a, a triple zero call. Uh, There were no live electric wires hanging around, you know, no poisonous venomous snakes or anything like that. The food didn't have any poisonous substances in it. We gave good gifts. And James is saying, our Father in heaven loves us. And by looking to the good that God gives us, by giving our attention and our affections to the good, What you'll find happening is that you have less and less time and focus on sin. The more we uh, express thankfulness for the good, you actually find your sinful inclinations dissipating. You see, there's only a certain capacity that all of us have. If we're filling our lives and our attention up with the good that God gives us, there is little room and space and time and energy to give in to sin. God gives us many good gifts. Think of the, the pleasure that is found in food. You know, the, the wonderful array of tastes and smells we enjoy when eating. Or think of the, the creation around us that we can gaze on it and touch and smell the, the sunset. If you're allowed to go and watch it at five o'clock at night, you know, the sunset, the sun rising, these beautiful things, looking out of the ocean and feeling the spray of the seawater on your face. Walking through a rainforest or hearing the sounds of birds and water running down a stream. Think of the gift of friendship. Think of God's gift of his spirit that he's given us who helps us to believe and to live for Jesus. Remember God's good word that he has given us that guides and comforts and rebukes us. And think of God's only son that he gave for us. Here's something that we can do every day. Either first thing in the morning or later in the day. Why don't you spend a few moments recalling God's good gifts to you that you have enjoyed that day or all that week. Write them down and thank him out loud for those good gifts. I love how we're reminded of God's character. James says God doesn't change like shifting shadows. You know, our world is changing constantly, isn't it, boy? I mean, we know that now. Like shifting shadows. In our backyard at home, the, the amount of sunshine that we, we have changes all of the time. It depends on the time of day, the, the season, and of course the clouds in the sky. During winter, we have almost zero sunshine in our little backyard. Uh, Claude, uh, he's our four-legged child, uh, Claude loves to, to lay out in the sun. But during the winter months, there is almost no sun for him to lay outside and enjoy. And the only place he can find for those four months or so of the year is a little pocket in in the garage where the sun occasionally just streams through and hits the the, the concrete floor. 
And so he likes to lay down there and enjoy the sun. But most of the time, it's just shifting shadows. But this image, isn't it, of James, it's a beautiful one. God doesn't change like shifting shadows. He is our father of the heavenly lights. That is, God remains constant, unchanging. He is the one certainty. You can go to him every day. We can hold on to his gospel at every moment. Friends, remember God's many good gifts. And above all, remember the new life he has given us. James here talks about our new birth and us being new, uh, the first fruits. New birth and first fruits. Look at verse 18. He chose us. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So James is saying, as we're thinking through temptation to sin, he says, remember what God has done for you. Remember he's chosen you and what he's chosen you to be. He has chosen to give us birth. That's that language of, of regeneration or being born again. And it's God's decision. It's God's doing. You know, the Bible describes us as being dead. We're spiritually lifeless. There's, 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 there's no pulse. And, and like a dead person, we can't do anything to change our, our situation. It requires, doesn't it, the power of God and the grace of God to give us that life. And how does he do it? James explains it's through the word of truth. That's a way of describing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of truth gives life to hearts that were not beating. And the purpose of this new life in choosing us, is, uh, we're told, is that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. First fruit might sound like a kind of uh, a strange name for Christians. But again, it reinforces this theme of new life. And that we are the beginning of what God will do throughout all the creation. Do you see the contrast James is making? Where in our sinful nature desire gives birth to sin and sin when fully grown gives birth to death. Instead of that, through the believing the word of truth, we are born again. And the word changes our desires. It changes our lives. And the result is life. Friends, when you're tempted to sin, don't blame God. Instead, remember what God has done for you. Remember the new life he has given you. Now, I don't think James is saying that at some point we are going to reach a level of, of spirituality or maturity where we will no longer face temptation. We know that's not the case. We will live with temptation until we reach heaven. Now, there may be sins in our lives that we uh, ultimately do defeat with, with God's help and we put them beside us and, and lay it behind us. But then there'll be other temptations to sin that we are uh, introduced to or that we'll be wrestling with for the rest of our lives. I mean, verse 13 starts with the assumption when you're tempted. James assumes we will be tempted to sin. But we can make progress. God wants us to make progress. God will help us to make progress. In the Tokyo Olympics that we uh, had on uh, TV a few weeks ago, there was an Australian racing in the 10,000 metre final. I'm sure some of you were watching it. Uh, the athlete's name, name is Patrick Tiernan. Now, the 10,000 metres is essentially a sprint. Can you imagine sprinting all the way from, I don't know, Mordialic Pier through to, to Sandringham Beach? Right? And that's essentially what it is. You know? Anyway, Tiernan was well placed in the final. He was in the top 10. He had a chance of, of a medal. And after 9,800 metres, he was still with a chance of getting a medal. But with only 150 metres remaining in the race, you could just see he was in trouble. His rhythm was shot to pieces. He began to, to stagger around. He, could, he couldn't run anymore. And with 50 meters left in the race, he collapsed. He just fell on, on, onto, onto the, the, the floor and he couldn't run anymore. 
But somehow he managed to stand again and, and his legs are wobbling around and his body was swaying and somehow he forced his body one step forward at a time until he reached the finish line. It was a, an amazing scene and no doubt one that uh, many Australians will remember for many years ahead. It was a, a, an Olympic high point, wasn't it? You know, when it comes to, to godliness, it's not a race. So the first one to reach the finish line is going to win. And it's not as though we must race that perfect race, otherwise we're going to be um, disqualified. None of us are going to finish the race without falling down at times, without scraping our knees, without staggering from time to time. But there is an encouragement here throughout the Bible to persevere. The encouragement isn't be perfect and win the race under your own steam. It is persevere. Keep going with God's help. I was thinking of this uh, race by Tiernan because of of a quotation that I came across by C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis has this to say about temptation. He was writing a letter to a friend one day, and he he said this to them. I know all about the despair of overcoming chronic temptations. It is not serious provided self-offended petulance, annoyance at heart breaking records, impatience, etc. doesn't get the upper hand. No amount of falls will really undo us if we keep on picking ourselves up each time. We shall, of course, be very muddy, muddy and tattered children by the time we reach home. But the bathrooms are all ready, the towels put out, and the clean clothes are in the airing cupboard. The only fatal thing is to lose one's temper and give it up. It is when we notice the dirt that God is most present to us. It is the very sign of his presence. Friends, as followers of the Lord Jesus, when we give in to sin, accept responsibility, repent, and ask the Lord to forgive you. And friends, as we run the race... Remember God's many good gifts to us and thank him for them. And direct your affections toward those good things. And remember, God has chosen us. Not to fail at the end of the day. No, he's chosen us, giving us new life. And it's guaranteed to us in Christ. And the more we grasp this grace, the more our desires will change over time to be in line with God's holiness and the more progress we will make. And friends, as we wrestle with temptation, wrestle against it, above all, remember this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. The Lord Jesus has walked the path before us. He's walked it for us. He died on the cross, that sinless sacrifice for us who constantly And repeatedly sin against him. So put your hope in him. And thank God for the Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask for your forgiveness. For when we blame you for the sin that is in our lives... Forgive us for attributing blame to you for sinful desires we have and sinful actions we pursue. And Father, forgive us for when we blame others, when we are accountable for the sin in our own lives. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who understands our weaknesses who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet did not sin. We thank you and praise you that he did not sin. And Father, we thank you that 
because of this, he, he was proved qualified to be our substitute on the cross. To die our death. That we might be forgiven of all our sin. That we might be given new life. That we might be the first fruits of all the creation. Father God, help us to keep fighting against temptation. May we not give up. Please, God, encourage us. Give our affections over to good gifts that you give us. Remind us of who we are in Jesus. And may this strengthen us in our resolve to say no to sin and to say yes to righteousness. And Father, we ask this for our good and for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.